his vicious cousins, the Kauravas. Let me just block this out. Um, yeah, the beloved wife of the Pandavas, Krishna's great devotee, Draupadi, was made to cry when this brother of Duryodhana, Dusasan, insulted her and touched her sacred hair, um, pulling the end of her sari, trying to disrobe her and trying to see her naked beauty. And Draupadi was turning to her five strong husbands. She didn't just have one, right? She had five and they were all heroes. She was turning to them and then she was turning to the great grandfather Bhishma, um, you know, the, the respected elders who were there in the assembly. And none of these great um, Kshatriya heroes could save her. She called out to all of them and, um, and no one could save her, right? They all failed her. And then she was trying to protect her chastity by her own strength, um, by, you know, the minimal strength of a, of a woman compared to this he-man, Dusasan. She's trying to keep her sari on and protect her chastity. And finally, she just gave up. And, and this is the lesson for, for us all. She just put her arms in the air and um, she called out to her dear Lord Krishna with her whole heart and mind. He Krishna Govinda Hare Marari He Nata Narayana Vasudeva O Krishna, O Govinda, O Keshava, O beloved of the gopis and lord of Vrindavan, O Janardhan, you destroy all afflictions and I am sinking into this ocean of Kuru warriors. She was sinking in an ocean of Kuru warriors. Oh Lord, oh soul of the universe, creator of the world, save me now. I'm distressed and losing my senses in this evil assembly. Wow. So Krishna was sitting in Dwarka at the time. He was sitting next to his queen Rukmini and he was hearing Draupadi's most pitiful cries, right? And he just jumped out of his seat and he ran swiftly out of the palace. And by his mystic powers, he expanded himself by his inconceivable power. And he went at once to Hastinapur by his mystic potency. And he entered that assembly hall without being seen by anyone. And he provided this unlimited supply of cloth to cover and protect um, Draupadi, beautiful, his beautiful devotee Draupadi. And this Dusasan, this hideous Dusasan was just pulling and pulling and pulling at her sari. And, and as he did so, she was just spinning around. Maybe you've seen this shown in a dance. It's an astoundingly beautiful dance that sometimes we get to see. Um, and she's spinning around and he keeps trying to disrobe her and there just seemed to be no end to this sari. And this astonished Dusasan, he's trying with even more strength but just Draupadi, she just remained covered and protected. And there's this huge, gigantic pile of cloth on the floor. And, um, and so seeing this most wonder, wondrous event, all the kings in the assembly, they're praising Draupadi and censoring this evil Dusasan. And he finally sat down just perspiring and exhausted. And then everyone in the assembly starts calling out, shame, shame, shame. And finally, uh, Bhima, one of the great Pandava brothers, um, he just jumped up to, to curse Dusasan for what he'd done. But afterwards, it's interesting, afterwards, Draupadi asked Lord Krishna, why did you wait so long before you came? And Krishna told her that he saw her turning to her husbands, turning to the respected elders in the assembly, and then trying to use her own strength as well. But then when he saw that she had, when, when she saw, when Draupadi saw that she had no other recourse, she turned to Krishna and she cried to Krishna. And then Krishna just came in an instant by his mystic powers. So it's one of the most stunning, powerful stories we have in our tradition. I think we all love this story and are so moved by this story, certainly I am.
Um, and sometimes it's said that the real reason for the battle of Kurukshetra, the real reason that it couldn't be averted was because of this insult to Krishna's great devotee, Draupadi. And Krishna is purchased by the love and tears of his great devotees like Draupadi. He tolerates, as Prabhupada says at the end of this purport, he tolerates any offense to himself, but he will not tolerate any offense to his dear devotees like Draupadi. So, yeah, my question to myself, my question to all of you is, can we also learn to follow the example of Draupadi, um, taking shelter of Krishna with our own tears, amidst our own sufferings in our own circumstances and situations in our lives. So yeah, I wanted to talk about this very important topic, Draupadi's tears. So we all know that in this world there's, there's, there's joy, but there's also so much suffering. And we all cry, right, from time to time over so many things. And even sometimes big, strong men also are brought to tears. It's not only women who cry or children who cry. Sometimes we cry when we're insulted or tortured or a great injustice is done. Just like in this pastime we're, we're studying right now. And um, sometimes we cry um, do you know when there's a, a loss of a dear child or friend or family member? And whenever we have loved and lost, um, there's always a cause for our tears. And I would say in this world, there's always a trail of tears. And so often, no one can explain why, no one can answer why, no one can really say. Remember Dharma the bull also in the first canto of, of the Bhagavatam? Maharaj Pariksit is asking a little bit later on, who did this to you? His legs are cut off, right? Who did this to you? And because he's Dharma personified, he's saying it's very difficult to say what the cause is of this suffering. So, um, yeah, just like in this assembly hall, no one can really explain how it is that Krishna's great devotee Draupadi is allowed to be insulted like this. And sometimes it's said that when dry bamboo, stalks of dry bamboo in the forest brush up against one another and create a fire, in the same way, um, sometimes there's fire in this world. There's suffering in their tears, like almost like a spontaneous combustion. Like who went to that fire? Who went to that forest to set that fire? Well, so often nobody, right? but still there's fire and still there's suffering. So just like Draupadi, I think of myself, I think of ourselves, sometimes we try and we try and we try everything in our power and we can't alleviate our suffering or so often we can't help to alleviate the suffering of other people either. And sometimes we see in, the, um, in these pastimes of Krishna's great devotees like the Pandavas, they seem to suffer even more than um, ordinary people. Um, once the great grandfather Bhishma Dev commented that Kunti Devi, the mother of the Pandavas, she was like a she deer in the midst of a pack of wolves. Her suffering was so great. And sometimes it's said that, that, um, that Kunti Devi was even more fortunate than Dev Devaki, Krishna's own mother Devaki who she was in the midst of so much suffering, put in prison, but she always had her husband Vasudev there by her side. And Kunti Devi only had Krishna. And she took full shelter of Krishna time and time again. And Krishna always gave shelter to Kunti and to her sons, even in the midst of so much immense suffering, right? So my question again to myself and to all of us, what can we learn from the suffering of Krishna's great devotees? The, um, yeah, the devotees are like um, Krishna's own children. And Krishna teaches the world how to love and how to cry out to him, how to take shelter of him, 
he teaches that through his own devotees. And the simple dependent devotees turn and face Krishna and call out to Krishna and reach out to Krishna and they express their suffering to Krishna. And Krishna works through his trusted devotees. So sometimes taking shelter of one of Krishna's trusted devotees who you have some resonance within your own heart. Um, yeah, taking shelter of Krishna, taking shelter of his trusted devotees. And it's important to understand that it's devotees on the path of crying for Krishna. They don't just stuff that suffering down um, where it can become toxic illness or bitter anger or, or a desire for revenge. All of those things are toxic and they make us very, very sick and frozen and immobilized. So what do devotees do when they're suffering in their lives? They lift it up and shine the light of remembrance of Krishna on that suffering, and Krishna reciprocates. Um, Draupadi was crying in extreme distress after her sons were killed by Ashvatthama, and Arjuna spoke to pacify, pacify her, and then Arjuna just went after that Asvatama. And then Asvatama released this Brahmastra weapon, although he didn't have the knowledge or the skill how to pull it back, how to retract it, right? He was uh, ignorant of how to, how to use this weapon, but he released it anyway. And then Arjuna saw that his own life was in danger, and he began to call out in distress to Lord Krishna. This is also a beautiful verse from the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Arjuna says, Krishna, Krishna, Mahabaho, Bhaktanam Abhayankara, Tom Eko, Dayamananam, Apavaragosi, Samsmitara. Arjuna said, Oh, my dear Lord Sri Krishna, you are the almighty personality of Godhead. There is no limit to your different energies. Therefore, only you are competent to instill fearlessness in the hearts of your devotees. Then he says, everyone, excuse me, everyone in the flames of material miseries can find the path of liberation in you only, Krishna. This is a prayer of beautiful crying out independence from Arjuna. And then Krishna told Arjuna to release his own Brahmastra to counteract the one that was released by Ashvatthama. And then the two Brahmastras, they met in the sky and made a circle of fire like the, like the disk of the sun in the sky. And then with his great skill and devotion, Arjuna just retracted both those Brahmastras um, as Lord Krishna had desired. Right? And then also in the first canto, what about Uttara? What about that other Brahmastra? Uttara was the mother of Maharaj Pariksit. She was holding him, holding his embryo in her womb. And when that other Brahmastra was hurled by Asvatthama to destroy the last living descendant of the Pandavas, um, that, that Brahmastra was just careening toward her to destroy the embryo. Maharaj Pariksit in her womb. And what did, she, what did she do? What did she say? She goes, Pahi, Pahi, Maha Yogin, Deva, Deva, Jagatpate, Nanyam Tvad, Abhayam Pasye, Yatra, Mrityu, Parasparam. O Lord of Lords, O Lord of the universe, you are the greatest of mystics. Please protect me, for there is no one else who can save me from the clutches of death in this world of duality. So my point is here, everyone, that cry out to Krishna um, or open your suffering heart to a trusted devotee um, or friend, just like Draupadi in, in the case just above, Draupadi opened her heart to Arjuna and then lift up the prayer of your heart to Krishna. Um, it's important to understand that as devotees, we need to show empathy toward the suffering of ourselves and others. But what is empathy? What's the difference between empathy and sympathy? 
Empathy is to try to be able to see through the other person's eyes, even if it's only for a moment, or to try to feel with them and be moved to, to help um, if necessary, and, and to show compassion. Compassion means to tremble with someone. To tremble with someone is compassion. To be there for the other person. Sometimes even if you don't know what to say, Sometimes just to just be there and say, you know, I just don't know what to say, but I just wanted to be here for you. That can be so important and so, so healing and so validating to a person who's suffering. And what's sympathy? Sympathy is looking down on someone and their suffering. Oh, you poor thing. It drives disconnection when we look down on someone like that. Sometimes sincere people try to help, but when that help is coupled with that looking down, then it, it actually drives disconnection. So empathy is what? Empath empathy is, is just listening, holding space, withholding judgment, and communicating a healing message that, my friend, you are not alone. You know? And sometimes so much is out of our control, but we can have faith that. When something's out of our control, it's still within the control of Krishna because everything is within the control of Krishna, right? And when we hear about the six loving exchanges between devotees, it's really about this. It's about being there for the other person, hearing from them, making sure they're feeling seen and heard, and to just allow them to share what's in their heart without you know, me placing my judgment and my, you know, judge, jury, and executioner, right? Here's a, I wanted to share with you a, a prayer of empathy that I love so much. Um, this is a prayer spoken by Prahlad Maharaj in a mood of deep empathy for the suffering of different living beings who are, he's observing in different stratas of consciousness. And this um, translation was, um, was rendered and spoken by Rabinda Swarup Prabhu, one of our God brothers, and spoken at the Washington National Cathedral here in, in Washington, D.C., after a, a great national tragedy and catastrophe in this country. So here's his beautiful translation of Prahlad Maharaja's prayer. He says, may the entire universe be blessed with peace and good hope. May everyone driven by envy and enmity become pacified and reconciled. May all living beings develop abiding concern for the welfare of others. And may our own hearts and minds be filled with purity and serenity. And then he brings, he takes it to Krishna in the end. May all these blessings flow naturally from this supreme benediction. May our attention become spontaneously absorbed in the rapture of pure love unto the transcendent Lord. How beautiful, isn't it? He prays for us to take shelter of Krishna. He prays for the envious people. He prays for all living beings in this prayer of empathy. So, yeah, you know, depending on our own individual nature and our own situations, taking shelter of Krishna may look like Draupadi, where we just lift up our hands over our heads and cry with tears in our eyes, right? Hey, Krishna, hey, Govinda. Or it may look like Arjuna taking up arms on the battlefield to defend Dharma and to defend others according to the will of Krishna according to what Krishna expressed to him. But the point I'm making is open your heart to trusted friends to express your suffering and then place your suffering at the lotus feet of Lord Sri Krishna. And like Draupadi, try to cry to him for his mercy. My dear Lord Krishna, unto you I, com I commend my spirit today in both my happiness and my distress. I don't know why I'm sick. I don't know why this happened to my dear friend. I don't know why this happened to these children in the schoolyard. I just don't know. 
but I just take shelter of you in my happiness and distress. And, you know, I should also say that so often when we're happy, right, we all want to be happy all the time. We don't want to be suffering. But so often in our happiness, we become complacent and we forget to take shelter of Krishna. But what about our, our fears, right? You know, we might say, oh, well, I want to take shelter of Krishna, but I'm so afraid in this situation. Am I going to get that job? Is my child going to get that degree? Is this going to happen? Is that going to happen? And, you know, it's it's also important to, to note, I think, that fear is an important um, protection or boundary that we need to um, teach our children and teach ourselves. Don't get too close to the edge, right? Don't run in the street. Don't drive too fast. Take a coat if it's too cold. And don't keep intimate association with those people who are addicted to bad habits and just keep pulling you down unless you are strong enough to help them, right? So I think it's important to take a lesson from the elephant Gajendra. You know the story of, of Gajendra? He was a creature of the land. And because this crocodile, who was a creature of the water, was biting on his leg, he, Gajendra, the creature of the land, was losing strength, losing strength, losing strength. And the crocodile was gaining strength being in the water. So we can learn from this story to pray to Krishna for fine discernment, to know where are my strengths? Where are my weaknesses? Can I really help this person? Or is he or she always pulling me down? Right? Sometimes, on the other hand, our fears are based on our misconceptions that I am made of matter, I am destructible, and I am temporary. This is the duality of this world. When we see we perceive a separation between ourselves and Krishna. Um, but taking shelter, crying to Krishna, means to articulate our hearts to Krishna and to, to really um, tell Krishna, I am a sacred part of you. You are my eternal friend and well-wisher, and you are the owner and controller and enjoyer of all things. Not me, Krishna. And you have my back, and you have my best interests at heart. And the fear I'm feeling right now is not me, right? I am eternal and ever existing in knowledge and in joy. So, this is my question to all of us Can we try to practice a new pattern, um, a new, you know, what's called a sanskar, right? A groove in our conscious, consciousness? Can we try to create a new groove in our consciousness and pray to Krishna and articulate it to ourselves and to him? Try to see and hear and express my own sincerity coming from my own heart, right? Speak it out to Krishna. I am your sincere devotee. From this day, I am yours. Speak it out so that you can hear it, so that he can hear it too. And, you know, I was also thinking about when Srila Prabhupada arrived in the Boston Harbor, and he's just on that freighter ship. It wasn't even like a cruise ship like we see today, but it's just a, a freighter ship. And he's, he's standing on the deck of that ship in the harbor, and he's contemplating this impossible mission that he'd taken on for the pleasure of his Guru Maharaj on the order of Lord Chaitanya. And Srila Prabhupada was, was crying to Krishna, actually, at that time. Right? And what was he saying to Krishna in his tears? He's saying, how will I make them understand this message of Krishna consciousness? And he's so humble. He says, I am unfortunate, unqualified, and the most fallen. Therefore, I am seeking your benediction so that I can convince them, for I am powerless to do so on my own. And then it says, somehow or other, O Lord, you have brought me here to speak about you. Now, my Lord, it's up to you to make me a success or a failure as you like. Isn't this really far out to me? It's very far out because 
He's not even asking Krishna to make him a success. No, he's expressing deep humility. And he's saying, Krishna, you're the Lord. It's up to you to make me a success or failure, whatever you like, right? And he's just expressing his complete dependence on his beloved Lord Krishna. Then he says, well, Lord, I'm just like a puppet in your hands. So if you have brought me here to dance, then make me dance. Make me dance. Make me dance as you like. I have no devotion, nor do I have any knowledge. He was called Bhakti Vedanta, right? Given the title of Bhakti Vedanta, which means knowledge combined with devotion. But he says, I have no knowledge. I have no devotion. But I have strong faith in the holy name of Krishna. And I've been designated Bhakti Vedanta. And now if you like, you can fulfill the real purport of Bhakti Vedanta. So these are Srila Prabhupada's tears as he stood on the deck of the Jaladutta freighter ship in the Boston Harbor, just praying to be empowered by Lord Krishna to be able to make his message understandable to us, to be able to touch our hearts with the compassion of his message. You know, I've heard Andrea, I've heard you say this before, and I know most of us, this, us, most of us when we started reading Srila Prabhupada's books, we couldn't figure out what he was saying. I remember when I first heard uh, recordings of Srila Prabhupada in San Francisco, I thought, wow, I finally found my guru, but I can't even understand a word he's saying, you know? So by the grace of Krishna, um, his words were made intelligible for all of us so that we could take shelter of him. So my point here is that we can also learn to, to try and cry to Krishna in the difficult circumstances of our lives both in our joys and in our sorrows. And these are the tears of the heart crying out in the mood of great devotees like Srila Prabhupada, like Prahlad Maharaj, and like the great Princess Draupadi. So these are a few thoughts. And um, I thank you all so much for being here. And I just want to ask if you have any reflections or what was important for you here. And I want to ask you also, what can we change about the way we cry out in this world, right? Because we all cry, right? But can we learn to cry to Krishna the way these great devotees do? So, yeah, that's my question. What can we change about the way we cry out in this world? So thank you so much. Any of you have any thoughts on this topic of Draupadi's tears crying to Krishna? Hare Krishna, thank you so much, Mother Mini Devi. Uh, it's, it's always so, so special to have your association and to have your wisdom and your motherly love. So it seems we have two hands up. Uh, Sriman Varaprabhu, please you may unmute and go ahead. Hare Krishna Mataji, my humble obeisances. <clears throat> all glories to Sri Prabhupada, all glories to all the devotees on the assembly. Thank you uh, for the nice lecture. So many things to reflect on. <clears throat> uh, I have two questions. One is, uh, you said many a time that we should cry to someone whom we resonate with. It's cry to, I get, I think I heard you saying we should cry to a friend or somebody closer, some, uh, and it appears to me that I've heard before that uh, crying to somebody on our level may not help us because uh, they may not be able to take us from our sorrow to something higher. Yes, so we have to good. always look for somebody higher. Yes, thank you but, so much. My uh, point is that, my point is that we should cry out to because krishna also works through his devotees so we should try cry out to krishna and krishna sends his devotees also so not someone on our level if i'm suffering like sometimes it's said that you know a bound person can't help another bound person but try to cry reach out to someone who maybe has a deeper realization than i do some some mentor that i found um, it's not necessarily even an 
senior devotee. Sometimes it's the person who um, just has many realizations, who's just come and is sweeping the temple. But try to reach out and take shelter of Krishna because he works through his devotees. So a trusted devotee who, has, who, who I can perceive has some deep realizations more than myself. So I hope that clarifies it because Krishna does have yeah. devotees. Um, but not, you know, not someone who's, who's maybe complaining or suffering in the same way I am with the same obstacles I'm suffering from, but someone who has a deeper realization finds find such a person. I hope that's helpful. Okay. Right, right. Thanks. Now, second one is also in the same line. Okay. And this is a practical example of Arjun crying to Krishna, uh, Drupadi crying to Krishna. But if you look into the case of Arjun, Arjun had a guru, Dronacharya, whom he trusted so much. And he had his grandfather, Bhishma, who loved him so much. But he could not cry to either of them mm. because they've already taken side. So he's in a better position. He has a better opportunity because Krishna is there physically. Mm -hmm. But in our own situation, if we are confronted with a situation whereby somebody who is acting as your guru or a mentor, and they are already taking side with evil, where do you turn to? It's really very difficult at that time saying you're crying to Krishna because mm -hmm. uh, that, that now demands a lot of faith. Mm -hmm. And that's Many a time, many people don't survive this. So what do we do in that situation? Yeah, it's, a, it's very, very true. So sometimes we have to, this is why I mentioned, um, to pray for that wise discernment. Because sometimes, just like Draupadi, she was also looking to Grandfather Bhishma. He's supposed to be there protecting Dharma, but he wasn't. He failed her at that time. And as you're giving this great example, Arjuna was failed by Dronacharya. He was failed by, at least initially, by Grandfather Bhishma. So he was calling out to Krishna, 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 Mahabaho. And we have examples in our own tradition of sometimes, just like Bali Maharaj, he had to reject the materialistic instructions that were being given by his guru. But that's an extraordinary example. So I would say before taking that extreme step of rejecting your guru, get advice from wise mentors, you know, because Krishna does work through his devotees. You can pray and call out to Krishna, 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 Mahabaho, only by your mystic power will I be saved. But then ask advice from wise mentors who in the Krishna consciousness movement, we're so fortunate. We have wise mentors all around us. So, um, yeah, try to take shelter of a wise mentor, you know, go see them or talk to them somehow. We have nowadays, we have amazing technology that we can use or we can misuse, right? Technology is all around us, but uh, we can use it or misuse it. So we have that, that benefit that we can take shelter of so many wise gurus. Um, and get Krishna's advice hearing through them. So, yeah. And sometimes we also have to have the humility that perhaps I'm wrong about this situation. Perhaps I'm not perceiving things correctly. Perhaps this injustice that I wanna complain about, perhaps it was my fault. Perhaps I had more than 50% um, worth of blame in this particular situation, more than that person. So that's why I think humility is of utmost importance to take shelter of wise mentors, but then also to be willing and, and open to having our faults um, pointed out to, to us as well. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you so much, Baraha Acharya Prabhu. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Srimad Baraha. Uh, we are Brother Sadhana Devi, please unmute. Hare Krishna, dear devotees. Please accept my humble obeisances, Rukmini Prabhu. Thank you for a beautiful lecture. That was so wonderful. I actually had the same set of questions that the Prabhu before had. Um, uh, and, I, and, and, and so my, firstly, I want to share my reflection that 
I just love today's talk because who do we turn to when we cry, you know? And it's, it's this uh, idea where suddenly when you're feeling that sorrow and when you're feeling like you might, it, it, it can be just that moment that you turn very quickly to Krishna. Or it could be that we try for all these things around us, you know, people around us, our support. So I love that um, idea that we can just suddenly turn and, you know, pray and, and get, get engaged into a better consciousness very quickly. So thank you for inspiri inspiring. Uh, as, as far as uh, turning to other devotees for, um, you know, for advice and guidance on, on, on very sort of emotional things, is it, is, it, um, is it that we burden them as well? Because wouldn't we sharing so much heavy load on other people who have their own lives, even though they may be evolved and very senior? Is it, you know, we still feel like you might be burdening them and adding more when sometimes you need to just do your own practice and, and keep at it? Right. Does that, does that question make sense? Thank you. It's a very, very good question. It's a very wise and deep question. But I think, I think the answer is both are true. You know, we have to do our own work and we have to actively take shelter of Krishna that unto you I commend my spirit today. You know, that I am taking shelter of you. And then at the same time, ask for wise guidance. And devotees who are, who are deep and wise and advanced on the path of devotional service. And here you have to use your discrimination because, um, you know, such persons will be compassionate and will not mind sharing their wisdom. But sometimes you can catch them at the wrong time. <laughs> like when you're standing in line at the Sunday feast, it's not exactly the right time to you know, open your heart with your deepest issues that, and sometimes if you, if your timing is wrong like that, you may take it that they're, oh, they didn't have time for me or they didn't really care. But sometimes, um, you know, to find the right time, like, is there a time when you and I could talk? Would you be open to that? Is there a time when I could just um, open my heart to you about some issues that are troubling me? And I am praying to Krishna and I am trying my best, but still I feel like, I would love to hear your thoughts as well. So it's it's a matter of finding the right person at the right time um, and opening your, opening your heart appropriately. You know. So I think and I th I think all of those things are there, and also that good gender example I think is very important. Sometimes it's a matter of getting myself out of harm's way. You know. Sometimes I'm. I'm so attached to doing things this way and this way and this in this scenario in this job in this 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 and this that I can't hear the the wisdom that wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute maybe this is actually what they call a situational depression where I need to get myself out of that situation and then things are going to be much better so hearing hearing the wisdom of someone who's a little bit outside of of um of that situation can be extremely helpful. But again, like um, Prabhu was saying, you know, we have to look for someone who's wise and deep and has the time and the space to hear and catch them at the right time. I think all of those factors are important. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Thank you. I hope that's Thank helpful. I hope yes, that's very much so. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, um, Mother Sadhana, for those questions. Uh, Shri Hari Chakra Prabhu, please unmute. Hare Krishna Mata, thank you very much for your class. Anytime I listen to your class, it's like my devotional service begins again. <laughs> thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you so much. Yeah, my my question is, uh, I mean, your, some some part is like you answered it uh, when you were answering uh, Baraha's question to some extent, but uh, my question is, usually I hear that we are supposed to cry out to Krishna, uh, surrender everything to Krishna, and Krishna is the doer, he will do everything. And this that statement, sometimes it baffles me. Like you just gave an example of Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada, we all know, is a pure devotee, but he was still crying out to Krishna. But after crying out to Krishna, he said, Krishna, whether you, I, was, I succeed or I fail, it's up to you. Even though he said like that, but as, at the same time, 
he took the required steps that will make him successful. Nice, nice point. Yeah. He was, he was, he, he was focusing on being successful. Right. But he said, Krishna, whatever you desire, that is okay. But that didn't make him relax and think that, oh, I've, I've cried to Krishna, so let Krishna uh, uh, do what, whatever he needs to do. Let Krishna do the needful. He worked towards success. So yeah. similarly, are we supposed to just cry out to Krishna and then wait when we have to use, instead of using our own intelligence and making sure that we take the required steps so that maybe Krishna, if Krishna wants that step to be successful, he will decide. If he doesn't, then whatever comes. So but I want you to explain it a little bit to my understanding. Okay, thank you so much. It's a great question. Uh, Hare Krishna, Mother Rukmini, I'm sorry. Uh, I want to add to that because I have a question which is in the same line. So I will just add to his so you answer us all together. Okay. And that is just as Hare Chakra Prabhu was asking. I have seen and I've also heard uh, that because uh, it is said that Draupadi was looking at her husbands for help. She was looking at Grandfather Bhishma Dev for help. She herself was trying to hold her chastity together so she doesn't become nude. And when they all failed her, when she herself couldn't help herself, she cried out to Krishna. But Krishna wondered her to cry out to him, Krishna, immediately. And so some devotees think and feel that, why do you have to cry out to anybody? Why do you have to attempt to do anything for yourself? You cannot do anything for yourself anyway. Krishna is the ultimate doer. So if, that, if we act or behave in that form, wouldn't we become lazy people? And excuse me to say, uh, excuse me, excuse me to say, foolish people, because Krishna has given us intelligence. Okay, Hare Krishna. <laughs> Great questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting because have, we've all heard the saying, God helps those who help themselves, right? So I was thinking when I was hearing both of your questions, Hare Chakra Prabhu, and your question as well, that, you know, even an ordinary mother or father in a family you know, a little child is, is bluffing the parents, you know, I'm just going to eat candy and I'm not going to eat my dinner or I'm not going to go to school. I'm just going to go to sleep. Even an ordinary parent can see through the bluff of a child who's just trying to be lazy or pull one over on the parents. So Krishna is not such a fool. And he's looking to see, are we um, utilizing our best intelligence and at the same time depending on him? And this is what Krishna's instructions are to Arjuna in Bhagavad Gita. Um, fight and remember me, right? Remember me and at the same time act. Um, and I was thinking also that, you know, sometimes we think I'm not going to listen to any of these devotees. They're all a bunch of fools anyway. I'm going to just wait until Krishna sends the helicopter. But sometimes if we're too proud, we don't recognize that helicopter when it comes, you know. And I was thinking while you were asking your question, actually, Hari Chakra Prabhu, about how Srila Prabhupada was once told by a librarian that he was saying Prabhupada was writing his magazine, right? And the librarian said to Prabhupada, you know, people throw magazines away. So rather than writing magazines, you should write books because books people will keep. And Prabhupada took that advice as coming from Krishna, even though it was coming from an ordinary librarian. So in the same way, if we're humble and if we're deep and we're looking for Krishna's instructions all around us, we can get intelligence um, from nature. We can get intelligence from other people even people who are not devotees, we can get instructions and wisdom even from a little child, right? Um, so it's a question of using our intelligence, using our discernment, and looking for help all around us. And not being, you know, you're right, Hari Chakra Prabhu, it's not as though Prabhupada was saying, you can make me a success or failure, and then did he just go to sleep on the boat? You know, did he even 
you know, okay, I'm just going to sleep and you can do everything, Krishna. No, that wouldn't be honest, right? That would be, you know, like a, a child who's trying to bluff his parents. No, no, Krishna's much more intelligent than that. So we have to utilize our best intelligence, pray for that fine discernment. If we're looking for help, find the right person to help me. And then ultimately cry out to Krishna because Krishna is um, the supreme controller, the supreme enjoyer, and our, and our ultimate friend. Hare right. Krishna, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, I have a question. I have a question from the purport. Uh, let me see if I can put it up here. Uh, in the paper, Sri Prabhupada was saying that uh, thus after the battle of Kurukshetra, after all the sons and grandsons of Dhritarashtra died in battle, all the wives of their family were obliged to lose any of their hair as widows. In other words, all the wives of the Kuru family became widows because of Dushashan's insulting a great devotee of the Lord. In other words, all the wives of the Kuru family became widows because of Dushashan's insulting a great devotee of the Lord. Now, uh, previously there had been this discussion about uh, curses and uh, somebody committing sin and another person committing offenses. So it was said that offenses are more uh, heinous than sin because when one commits sin, it's just he himself. When one commits offense, is a generational punishment. Now that uh, brought about lots of uh, philosophical discussions. Now we see seeing in this paper that Sri Prabhupada is saying that the Kuru family, uh, they all perished because of one single man's nonsense, Dushashan, disturbing Drupadi's hair. Now the question I have is, why should, let's say Dushashan is my brother and Dushashan has mistreated Draupadi. Why should Dushashan's mistreatment to Draupadi cause me to be killed? When maybe even when, when Dushashan was acting his nonsense, I wasn't there. I didn't know anything about it, but simply because I relate to do session. I have to suffer. Why should I suffer for someone else's nonsense? That's my question. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there is such a thing as a collective karma that we see in our countries. Like, like maybe we say, we think, well, I'm not cutting down the rainforest in Brazil. Why should I have to suffer from global warming? But yet in a sense, we're all implicated um, because of the complexity of Kali Yuga. But if we look at the example of the Kauravas, you know, there were opportunities for others to speak out and Vidura did just that. He spoke out again and again and told his, he loved his brother, his blind brother, Dhritarashtra. And he spoke out again and again. And even one of the sons of Dhritarashtra, I think his name was Vikarna, was the only one of those hundred sons who spoke out that this is not just. And so, you know, there is an opportunity for us to speak out. And, um, and then again, after the whole destruction of the battle that Vidura came back and he spoke so strongly to Drita Rostra, you're just living like a kept dog in the house of Yudhisthira eating his remnants and he's, was the cause of the death of all your sons, have you no shame? And then finally, like a little slap or a big slap, Dhritarashtra actually finally heard the good advice 
and then he left the kingdom. He didn't even tell his beloved secretary, Sanjaya, where he was going. They just left, and he was able to, um, to get some footing in some mystic yoga. Because of his offenses to the Pandavas, he wasn't able to get uh, pure bhakti, but he was able to take some steps. And as Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, that every step is a step uh, toward him. That every step anyone takes for spiritual progress is, is his path actually ultimately coming closer to him. So when we try to look at sins and offenses and curses, who can understand, you know? All I can say is that sin is when we turn away from Krishna, right? Offenses is when we're so proud, we think we know more and we think we can take some proud stance against some other devotee. The best thing is to remain close to the ground and to remain humble and to say, um, how can I serve you? How can I understand better how to serve you? How can I serve you, Krishna? How can I serve your devotees and help them to take the next step? And if it's if, if I think that I have to criticize someone and chastise them and correct them, the very best way to do that is by setting an example myself. Uh, that's, that's the type of chastisement that can really be heard. Um, maybe we've mentioned before, St. Francis said, I try to preach all day, and if necessary, I use a few words. So that's the type of powerful, heart-changing example that we can utilize in our lives, in our temples, in our families, in our workplaces. And then what happens is if we act like that, acting by example in, in a mood of servant leadership, as Bhakti Tirtha uh, Maharaj used to say, if we act in that mood of servant leadership, then even if it, in our own offices, someone will come up and say, hey, you know, what is it about you? You just don't get ruffled like everybody else here. What is it about you? What are you drinking? What are you tasting? What are you chanting? What are you reading? Because tell me, tell me. Yeah, tell me, tell me, because I need that in my life. Whatever it is that's making that difference in your life, I need that in my life. And that's real Krishna consciousness. That's what we should be hearing all the time, you know? I mean, I, I don't know if my, I've told this story before, but once my husband was, he be, after he became a brahmachari, he was on Harinam Sankirtan on the street in Denver. And one of his um, college uh, friends from college was saw them. And he, he came up to him and he goes, Jeff, Jeff, is that you? And, and he was a little embarrassed thinking, oh, this guy's I got a big job. And he sees me just jumping up and down like this. And this guy said to him, you know, I'm just a lawyer. Look at me. All I am is just a lawyer. But look at you. You're actually doing something giving your life to God. Wow. You know? <laughs> so, you know, that's the type of devote, uh, example that devotees um, uh, need to set in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Mother. I mean, uh, I, I hope and pray that, especially every audience present here uh, wasn't sleeping or dozing or having any sort of distraction when you started answering, especially my question. Every, every question asked here, but especially my question, which is the last answer you just gave, in the sense that uh, the question I asked is, it's not just a rhetorical question, it's, it's a real situation that some of us are experiencing, going through. And if I'm not mistaken, if I heard you clear, you were saying that it, I mean, it's very delicate and complicated when it comes to karma, but it seems from the answer you gave that those who saw the, the mistreatment and took their eyes off like nothing happened. Eventually they had to suffer. Okay. And I remember uh, an amazing class my Guru Dev Bhakti Swami Maharaj gave in Mayapur of 1997, uh, which is uh, entitled, Sri Prabhupada is coming back again. 
where it says, Sure, Prabhupada is coming, and when he comes and then asks you, where is this devotee who helped open the Gurukul in Dallas? Then what are you going to say to Sri Prabhupada? Sri Prabhupada, I do not know. So he gave so many analogies and examples that if Guru Krishna has made you become aware of a situation, then they want you to do something about it. So there are certain things going on. Devotees know about it, but they've turned deaf ears, blind eyes to them. And I'm thinking that if devotees are listening to this class clearly, there is nothing wrong in humbly telling somebody that I don't think what uh, you're doing or you're saying is appropriate. Uh, why don't we check ourselves to see? You cannot do it. Go to a senior person who can do it. But to be completely silent, as if nothing is happening, I believe does not help the individual and does not help our movement. So I hope everybody listening here and whoever may watch this on YouTube will learn that if Krishna has made, it, made something known to us, then it means Krishna, Guru, wants us to play a role. And we should ask ourselves, what role did we play? Hare Krishna, thank you so much for the answers. Thank and uh, uh, devotees, see, we are very fortunate today. Today is Friday. If if we can hold mother down here for a little longer, please, let's do that. We haven't had her for quite a long time. So please, if you have questions, realizations you want to share, please go ahead. Thank you all so much. Hare Wonderful Krishna. to be with all of Hare, you. Hare Krishna Mataji. Hare Krishna. Shri Govinda. Hare well. Hare Krishna Mata. Please accept my respectful obeisances. Our glory to Shri Prabhupada. And the God of glory to our Vaishnavas. But uh, I have a, I have this uh, question. I mean, I'm questioning myself that, uh, you know, Krishna says that he is a super soul in the heart. And from him comes remembrance, knowledge, and forgetfulness. <clears throat> so before we can remember anything, that remembrance must come from Krishna. We don't have power to, to remember anything without Krishna consent. And so, and he says that uh, we should always remember him. He, that, he said we should always remember him. And he says he gives that remembrance. So that, that point is a, is a little bit conflict there. Always remember me, but I have to give you that remembrance to remember me. <laughs> nice question. Thank you. You know, the way I would answer that is sometimes then, I like, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. That is a question number one. But I would like to ask the question number two. Just imagine uh, Drupadi's services to Krishna is very, very, you know, it was very obvious that he was a great devotee. Uh, Gajendra was a great devotee. Uh, Duva Maharaj, a great devotee. So just imagine what what happened, the, 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 what they went through, if they wouldn't have remembered Krishna, would Krishna, Krishna would have allowed them to suffer or what would have happened to them in case of like Drupadi? Because mm -hmm. Krishna only came in after she has rose up her hands. Okay, so this is part two of your question. It's part two. So here's, here's how I would try to answer your, your very wise question. 
Krishna is sitting in our hearts. And I like to say that he's unemployed if we don't turn to him. He's waiting for us to give him some uh, direction of how we want to love him or how we want to not love him, how we want to run away from him, how we want to not hear. Like we may be standing in front of the deities doing lip service, oh, Krishna, help me remember you. But then as soon as I walk out of the temple room, I may do something that really helps me forget Krishna. You know, like maybe as soon as I walk out of the temple room, I do something to break the regulative principles or I commit some violence to some other person. So Krishna is sitting in our hearts waiting to see how, how, how do we want to remember him? How do we want to turn to him? And he'll give us intelligence according to how we ask him. So if I'm begging him, please show me how to remember you in all situations. Show me how to find gratitude to you. Show me how to worship the devotees and honor the devotees. Show me how to really listen when I chant your holy names, and he'll help us. But if we just um, live on automatic pilot, you know, then uh, he will also be a little bit distant to us, you know. Like sometimes someone says, um, I have no problem with my relationship with God. He doesn't bother me, and I don't bother him. My relationship with God is fine. That's the way I like it. No. Krishna is waiting to see how, what is our desire. His desire is that we all love him and come back to Goloka Vrindavan. But he doesn't want to fill up Goloka Vrindavan with a bunch of riffraff people who don't really want to be there, right? Only people who really want to be there can be there. So he's waiting to hear, what do you want? He's sitting in your heart, Govinda Das, and he's waiting to hear, how does Govinda Das want to remember me? Does he really want to listen when he's chanting? Does he really want to reach out and be kind to other devotees? Does he really want to serve me in some way using his talents? And then Krishna will give us, each of us, intelligence. Because whatever you have, those are God's gift to you. How you use them are your gifts back to Krishna, back to God, right? So, uh, yeah, Krishna is not a fool. He's waiting to see. Um, how we want to come to him, how we want to remember him. And when we forget, we can also cry out and be motivated. Oh, Krishna, I just spent the last hour chanting Japa, but I didn't even hear one single mantra. And then Krishna, Krishna, help me, please help me. And then he will help us, you know. Um, you know? If we have trouble getting up in the morning, you can pray to Krishna before you go to take rest at night. Krishna, please help me get up. I want to get up early and I want to chant your holy name before the day gets going. And then he will help us. You know, some devotees don't even use an alarm clock because Krishna wakes them up because Krishna knows they want to be woken up. So those are a few thoughts. All right, Krishna, thank you so much. <laughs> Wouldn't uh, the popular saying, uh, come on saying that God helps those who help themselves be applicable in this scenario, right? Yes, absolutely. And I was thinking of another one. You know, the American Puritans used to say, um, he who sees the need does the deed, mm. you know? So sometimes you walk into the temple and you think, wow, why doesn't somebody sweep the floor around here? This place is a mess. Well, that means Krishna just gave you that service. Pick up a broom, sweep the temple yeah. or, you know, why are the offerings always late? Or why, 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 why this? Instead of sitting around criticizing, you know, we can just take it up. He who sees the need does the deed. That's humility. Yeah. Let me see how can I help. You know, you see, oh, nobody's cooking the offering on Wednesdays. Well, maybe I could volunteer to cook the Rajbo's bog offering on Wednesdays if everybody's so busy. Or something. Do something. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So... <laughs> Those are a few thoughts. Yeah. So, Mother, there was this uh, discussion on our uh, platform here a few days ago that um, Krishna acts for us as loving entities to uh, learn and follow and act as such. But we also understand that some acts uh, of Krishna 
are not meant for human beings. They are just his own pastimes. So there was this question about, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Krishna, uh, since your name is Rukmini, uh, we believe your, your Lord, uh, Rukmini, was, we, we, I want to find out that Krishna just uh, went to, I don't know how to exactly put it so I do not become offensive. <laughs> But uh, did, did Rukmini actually wanted to be with Krishna or just Krishna just forced himself on Rukmini and then took her away? I, I want you to share more light on that because it, it, it was obvious that such an act is not an act we as living entities will have to emulate. It's Krishna performing his pastimes with his pure devotees. But I want you to shed some light on that. Okay, well, Rukmini was, uh, in her letter to Krishna, she was actually apologizing to Krishna that she was such an arrogant young girl that how dare I ask you to come and kidnap me? This yeah. is not appropriate. You're looking at your position and looking at my position. How dare I ask you? But she was so ardent and so enthusiastic and so... She couldn't be satisfied with anyone less than Krishna. She couldn't marry Sisupal. So uh, I think it's a great lesson that um, she was uh, so enthusiastic and she was so, she took the chance of uh, begging Krishna even though it was not even appropriate. So maybe we can also pray to Krishna like that. Like, mm -hmm. I know I'm not qualified, but Krishna, please, please engage me in your service. Even though I'm a fool and a rascal, I have no intelligence, I have no devotion, but please, could you please, please engage me in the service, even though I have no qualification. I think that's a lovely prayer, you know? And mm -hmm. Krishna is just looking to see our sincerity. Really, he, he just accepted Rukmini because of her ardent uh, sincerity. So there's no qualification. He, you know, he said to uh, Narada Muni later that, he wasn't actually attracted to the beauty of Rukmini. He was only attracted by her devotion. Devotion. So, yeah. So I think that's a good lesson, you know, mm. that even though we have no qualification to just beg Krishna, that please, please accept me. And please show me, um, teach me how to become qualified and become acceptable to you. Show me how to drop off those qualities that you won't accept and how to take off the good qualities that you that you love, like your devotees. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, Hare Krishna. Yeah. Hare yeah. Krishna. Yeah, go ahead, Shri Kavila. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, there was a call that came to, that came to distract my attention. Sorry. Okay, uh, go ahead, Shri Kavila. Uh, yeah. So, um, Hmm. The question is gone. That's that's mm -hmm. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> the question is gone. Okay, the question okay. is gone. I'm, okay, I'm I'll, come, I'll, remember. I'll, I'll come back again. <laughs> yeah, I'll help you remember the question. Mother Rukmini, see, uh, of course, I do not know you that much, but I know I know you a little bit because. I've heard you speak and I'm hearing you speak. And if, if I'm wrong, please tell me. My little observation about you is that you, you are quite a prayerful person. And one thing I see in our precious movement is that I don't know whether we are not being encouraged or it's just the nature of the system. Devotees are not prayerful, including myself. I hardly pray. But I also realize from you and from other devotees that 
prayer is very, very important. After all, it's one of the nine processes of devotional service. But oftentimes we do not pray and all we pray is Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. But once I was having a conversation with a Kavira Prabhu at the Institute House and he was saying that in fact, if devotees could learn to pray like the Christians do, devotees will go a very long way in their devotional service. No, we're not praying to Krishna, give me this, give me that, which are like material things. But if we could pray behind the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, we chanted that, Shri Krishna, I'm praying, Dada, give me service. But when the service comes, please also give me the strength, give me the knowledge by which I can perform the service, something like that. So I want to ask from you if you are to uh, advise or encourage the Buddhists to be prayerful, how should we pray? Yeah, you great question, thank you. You know, the whole Srimad Bhagavatam is prayers after prayers after prayers. We have the prayers of Kunti Devi, we have the prayers of Arjuna, we have the prayers of Prahlad Maharaj, we have the prayers of the Prachetas. Every canto of Srimad Bhagavatam has so many, many prayers. So we should learn. And when we're chanting, we should also think, why am I chanting? You know, I'm chanting to please you, Krishna. I'm chanting for your pleasure. So I'm not just a, like a puppet or like a parrot. But why am I chanting? Why is my mouth moving like this in order to please you? So please let me please you. And I love the prayer of, you know, you mentioned the Christians. I love the prayer of Jesus Christ. Unto you I commend my spirit, my Lord. I don't know why this is happening, but unto you I commend my spirit. So that's a beautiful mood of chanting. I'm chanting for your pleasure, and unto you I commend my spirit. Please show me the way. Show me how to live this day um, in your service and in remembrance of you. I see that Anadi Nidanam. Anadi Nidanam, yes. Do you, do you remember him, mother? This used to be Bhakta George. Ah, oh, he looks very familiar. So yeah, congratulations on Bhakta, your initiation. Bhakta George is now a newborn. <laughs> what, is, what does Anadi Nidanam mean? Well, good. Uh, Anadi Nidanam, please answer your question. Answer the question before you ask your question. <laughs> well, well, I Anadi Nidanam. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> what actually the meaning is Krishna without the beginning, without no end. Okay. Yes, please. Hare Krishna. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, yeah, yeah Mona, thank you very much once again. Uh, I think part of my question has been answered by you. Then I have to ask. Uh, talking about prayers, actually, personally, I have this notion that, uh, which of course in the Bible, that even before you go to your knees, God knows everything. So to me personally, I think God knows whatever I need already. So why do I then go ahead and bother him? So <laughs> I, I don't know what to pray for actually. So even during fire gear, when the banana was given to us to pray and say our wishes, <laughs> if we don't have anything to say, we then chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. So I don't know if I'm wrong or not. Because whatever I desire, whatever I want, so Krishna knows already. So to me, I think it's like moderation. So I don't know. Please guide me on this. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. Great question. You reminded me of two things. One thing is uh, Srila Prabhupada only asked his guru one question, how can I serve you? So that's a very, very nice example. And also you reminded me of the prayers of Maharaj Prithu in Srimad Bhagavatam, where he says something very similar to what you said. He said, you know, my dear Lord, you are the father and we're the kids and the kids don't know what's best for them. So I can pray for all the things I think will be good for me but you know what's best for me. So please give me what's best for me. So that's a very beautiful prayer also. But I think also as the kids grow up a little bit, 
when they go past the selfish teenager age and they can become responsible adults and the kids can start taking up the uh, business of the father, whatever that mission may be, then the father and mother feel so gratified that, wow, this Anadi Nidanam Prabhu, now he's taking responsibility for my temple. Wow. I'm so grateful because now he's not just a baby, not knowing what, what to say or what to do, but now he's actually standing up and taking responsibility for this mission. And that's when the guru gives unlimited potency. Just like the beautiful story of when Bhakti Tirtha Swami came to Mayapur and Prabhupada was just rubbing his head, rubbing his head saying, thank you so much. He had been risking his life you know, riding those subway cars in, in the Soviet Union, you know, with no, no fixed abode, just trying to distribute Prabhupada's books and risking his life. So when the guru, when Krishna or the guru sees that, he sh sh shows so much mercy, blesses unlimited mercy. So it's a combination. Don't be, don't be foolish and try to take up some responsible service and ask, how can I serve you? I hope that's helpful. Thank you so much, Mother. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, very, very yeah, our, our, our question. Did you remember? Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm still on my question of uh, remembering Krishna. Krishna says, remember me. Always remember and not to forget me. Uh, so this... Uh, this is Krishna. He wants us to love him. He wants us to always remember him. He, all, he wants us always to know ourselves and the, the connection we have with him and try to act as such, not to forget him under any circumstance. But we also know that Krishna is uh, the supreme loving personality. And so, uh, and so uh, he guides us uh, in anybody at all that you may, you may choose to occupy based on you know, our activity. That is the way you may choose to occupy it because Krishna gives us what, what we want. Uh, Prabhupada says, if you want to become a dog, Krishna will give you a dog body, no problem. If you want to become a cat, you get a cat body. But in anybody that we try to use, Krishna is still with us as a super soul, guiding us. So coming back to the same question, uh, Krishna, uh, uh, like I was asking the, the Drupadi, what would have happened to Drupadi if he was not, uh, her hands was not completely raised up towards Krishna? Because Krishna has to give her that intelligence to remember her. And that is, that is one. Because without Krishna's mercy, without Krishna's coming in, she couldn't have remembered Krishna. Krishna would have made her forget about him completely. And so remembering Krishna at that point means was Krishna's mercy. Otherwise, is there any devotee, staunch devotee like Drupadi, who died would I remember Krishna in the scriptures? Thank you so much. Um, so the thing is, if we let Krishna know that we always want to remember him, then sometimes even in a situation where we think that we're unable to remember him, like the time of death, he will help us remember him. And there's a nice, um, I'm reminded of a story of Ramanuja Acharya, he was asking his deity the very question that, that you're asking, actually. He was saying, what if your devotee can't remember you at the time of death? And his deity gave a very beautiful answer. He said, then I will remember my devotee. If my devotee is not able to remember me, I will remember my devotee. So that's a very, very beautiful um, prayer, but also knowledge of Krishna's mercy, that even if maybe, you know, like a truck pulls in front of my car and, you know, still Krishna will remember even if, because if we're always begging Krishna to help us remember him, 
he will help us remember him. And at those times when maybe we can't remember him, he will remember us. So that's a very beautiful uh, story. Mm -hmm. So I hope that's helpful. Hare Krishna. We have a Hare lot of questions. Thank you all so much for your deep introspection. Thank you so much, Mother Rukmini. I, I, there is a story I read, if you wouldn't mind. I, I want to say, I will try to make it brief because Shumadwara has his hand up. Just to buttress your point that there was a cab driver who, who got a call to pick somebody. And when he went to pick this person, he was a very elderly man. So he helped uh, got his things in the cab and then he drove him to his destination and it was a nursing home. So when they got to the nursing home, uh, he helped the elderly man take his luggage out and then helped him to see the person he was going to visit. And when they got there, the cab driver realized that the elderly man was going to visit uh, another elderly woman who had like a very, very advanced stage of Alzheimer's disease. The, the, the elderly woman doesn't even remember anything about the guy, about the elderly man. So the cab driver asked me, says, you were, you were going through so much hustle, uh, hustle to come see this woman, but she doesn't even know you. She doesn't remember you. They say, yeah, she doesn't remember me, but I remember her. And the the woman happens to be the woman appears to be his wife, Aww. who now has a very advanced stage of Alzheimer's disease. So if if an ordinary human being can act like that, what to speak of the supreme merciful Lord Shri Krishna? Thank you so much, Mother. Thank you. Beautiful story. Thank you so Thank much. Shuman Vara Prabhu, please unmute and then go ahead. Maybe uh, this may be the last. A uh, question for Mother, so that we let her go. Shri <laughs> <laughs> please. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Actually, it's, it's not much of question, okay. uh, like uh, comments, and uh, maybe. Uh, first, uh, I thank Mother for reminding us about our Guru Maharaj's teachings. Uh, every time I hear her, uh, cited some of uh, um, Gurudev's uh, Teaching, uh, it's really very pleasing to hear that. Uh, two things. Um, that helps me also to remember what Gurudev said about, about uh, prayer. Our, our, Guru, our Gurudev is very prayerful. And uh, uh, he always talk about the power of prayer. And then he mentioned something about uh, push. Uh, because it's like uh, when a woman is in labor, she has to push. So a woman in labor is also like a devotee who is also pregnant of uh, Krishna's mission. He has to push. Because when you have Krishna's mission, it's like you have to give, a, give birth to a baby. Uh, so you also have to push. Uh, in those, if you have any mission at hand, it's like you're a pregnant person, you have to learn to push. And then uh, he described push as uh, pray until something happens. <laughs> that is push. Pray until something happens. So if you really have Krishna's mission at hand, uh, you are forced to pray. Because in order to deliver, to make that mission happen, you have to learn to push. And pushing means pray until something happens. So that is one thing that Guru Dev left behind for us. And then the second thing, uh, Mataji mentioned that Guru Dev said, we should be the example. If you want to change the situation and you find that you can, then go and be the example. And he said that many, she said that many times, uh, should be the model. Uh, and uh, I remember Guru Dev telling me that Personally, also when I didn't, uh, no longer wanted to uh, be a manager, temple manager. I said, "No, Guru, I don't want to." And he said, "You have to do it. 
because that has to be a model. If you just go tell, telling people what to do, then they will say it's not possible. But if you do something and let others see that, then whatever you say, they will take it serious. So wow. thank you, Mataji, for reminding us of uh, our Guru Dev's uh, teachings. Uh, well, I'm very much always happy when anybody helps to remind us of our Guru Dev's teaching. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. Very, very beautiful remembrances of such a great acharya and example for us all. Thank you. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Mother Rukmini Devi Ki Jai. Uh, dear devotees, please, uh, I, hope, I hope everybody is fully filled. Uh, we are all satisfied. And so at this point, we're going to kindly request all of you to unmute. And then we chant big Hare Krishna. <clears throat> With our appreciation for Mother's presence and wisdom. Uh, this Friday, so that we will be Krishna conscious throughout the weekend and come back next week fully Krishna conscious. Jay. Hare Krishna. Hare Hare Krishna. 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 Hare Hare. Hare Hare. Hare Hare. Rama Rama. Hare Hare. Hare Hare. Hare Krishna. 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 Thank you. Iskan Ghana Kijai. Thank you so much. Iskan Nigeria, Iskan Togo, Iskan Africa, Iskan West Africa, Kijai. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So, dear devotees, you all have a very blissful Krishna Krishna. Bible Krishna. We meet again next week, Monday. Hare Krishna. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Mata. Thank you, Mata.